hundreds of sperm, along with my brother sperm and the brother and sister sperms in the audience. <laughs> we are here to introduce John Warner and to ask for your help. We sperm are becoming an endangered species. Sperm rates are going down all across Western Europe and the United States. Fertility rates are going down for women as well. And the asthma rates, the childhood cancer rates, the percentage of children with learning disabilities and diabetes, and the rates of adults with Parkinson's disease and breast and prostate cancer are going up. Part of the reason for this growing crisis of chronic disease is the problem of toxic chemicals. But this is a problem we can fix. First, we need Congress to fix the old and broken 1976 federal chemical law, the Toxic Substances Control Act. It's hard to talk as a sperm. Um, <laughs> I think that's why they don't do it most of the time. Um, <laughs> Congressional representatives need to hear that a new bill introduced by Congressman Henry Waxman and Bobby Rush, if it doesn't pass, their sperm may be next. <laughs> Here in Marin, the sperm are passing out postcards that we're asking you to fill out and then drop into a bucket so that we can mail them for you. If you don't get one, please come seek us out so we all don't end up seedless in Seattle. And for all of you beaming pioneers, you can go to www.saveoursperm.com to send your message to your legislator. The second part of the solution is the innovation, creativity, and gumption embodied in our next speaker, John Warner, President and Chief Technology Officer of the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry. John received the 2004 Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring and got to spend time in the Oval Office with the President. He was the American Institute of Chemistry's Distinguished Chemist for the Year in 2002. He received the Council of Science Society's President's 2008 Leadership Award and was named by ISIS as one of the most influential people impacting the global chemical industries in 2008. Please join me in welcoming one of the people who really is saving our sperm and our future, John Warner. Now, you may be thinking it's strange to be introduced by a sperm, <laughs> but if you really think about it, you all were. <laughs> um, you ever ask yourself, why do we have hazardous materials? Who in their right mind wouldn't synthesize a red dye that caused cancer? Who in their right mind would develop a plasticizer that causes birth defects? Why are we in the situation that we're in? Why is it that every time we open up the newspaper, every time we open up, you know, turn on a Google search or something like that, we're hearing about toxic this, toxic this, bad this, bad this. How did we get in this place? If we want to fix it, if we want to get to a world that doesn't have toxic materials, I think the critical question we have to ask is why do we have them in the first place? Right? I'm an industrial chemist. I'm the person that works for industry that invents the materials. I think we could, we could spend some time thinking about molecules, or we could spend some time thinking about how do we make chemists? Sperm side of stuff. Um, but how do we train our chemists? But I didn't start life as one of these boy wonder, you know, chemistry kids that grew up wanting to, to make molecules in my, you know, I, I had no idea what chemistry was. I was, uh, had a huge Sicilian family in south of Boston. I, my mom had 11 brothers and sisters. I had 35 first cousins within a one mile radius growing up. <laughs> we were plumbers, electricians, carpenters. We didn't know what higher education was. We had no idea what college was. You know, I decided one day, crazily, that I was going to go to college. My family was a little bit put off by that. Well, you're going to be a professional student. Look at your brothers have excellent jobs. So I made a deal that I'd work construction while I went 
to undergraduate. I went to UMass Boston, $200 a semester while working full time in construction. And, but what was the most horrifying thing is what I went to school for. I was a music major. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, and so I'm, I'm going to school, I'm taking classes, I'm a music major. I have a, a band, it's, you know, it's the typical high school, college band. But you know what the name of it was? The Elements. <laughs> not carbon, not hydrogen, not oxygen, not that stuff. It was a Rubik's Cube, some glass ball. You know, it was the early 80s. That's what we called the Elements. Um, we sounded a little bit like the Cars with a little bit better lyrics. Um, but... <laughs> Things were going good. We were, we were you know, recording. We, we actually had a couple recording contracts. We were playing three nights a week at some of the best slash worst bars in Boston. Things, <laughs> things were going, going well. And all of a sudden, the, the drummer of the band, my friend, got leukemia. And over the course of six months, he passed away. So um, I'm taking gen ed education. I have to take an English class, a science class, a, you know, a history class to get my, my degree. And I was taking chemistry to fulfill my chemistry requirement, my, my science requirement. Oh, it was probably the right time in the day, so I signed up for it. And, <laughs> and I'm in there taking, taking the class one day, and a, the professor that's teaching the lab comes in. And he walks into the lab, looks right at me, walks right by me, looks to the person next to me, and says to the kid next to me, would you like to do research? Well, all of a sudden, I'm not in a band. I got a lot of time on my hands. I overheard the conversation, and I said, can I come? <laughs> and I walked into the lab, and I got to tell you, an epiphany happened. All my life, because I have to be marginally good at music, I was an artist. And in the world, there are two things. There are artists, and there are scientists. And I was an artist. What would I do in science? To me, science was you do a calculation, put a number in a box, and then if you get it right, you get a check and a pat on the top of the head. If you get it wrong, you go back and you do it again. Um, not the most interesting career that I could imagine. Um, but when I got into the lab, it was like, wait a minute. Scientists create. Scientists make stuff. And I actually had this idea that if you rammed my head full of electrodes and sat at a piano and composed a piece of music or designed a molecule, I picture the same neurons fired. And creativity is something that's special and wonderful. And the word art and the word science is actually human language, but not reality. And once I got that and I figured out that I could be creative and do stuff, uh, I, I said, OK, maybe I'll try this. And I went crazy into chemistry. So all the time that I was spending in, 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 the, in the music world, I now started the channel into chemistry. And so I, uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week pouring beakers and flask, and I actually found out I was OK with this. I published like six papers as an undergraduate in peer-reviewed journals. You know, by 19 years old, I spoke at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington on my research. In fact, I made the cover of Celebrity Magazine with Boy George. <laughs> <laughs> Not as a musician, but as a chemist. The, the, the Celebrity Magazine calls me up one day and says, John Warner, we consider you one of Boston's best and brightest gra college graduates. Come and have your picture taken. I said, no, and I hung up the phone. They <laughs> called me back a little bit later. Really, we want you to come and have your picture. I go, really, and I hung up the phone. <laughs> well, the next day I go to school, and I'm working in the lab, and I'm pouring my beakers, I'm pouring my flasks and everything, and I'm working in the construction industry, so I've got a flannel shirt, I'm not shaved, I'm not snappy dressed as I am now, and I'm, <laughs> I'm hiding, I'm hiding, in the chancellor of the university, comes and bangs on the door and says, you will go get your picture taken. <laughs> and so kicking and screaming, they pull me with all these snappy dressed people, and they do this story on how this kid has assembled 100 molecules that have never existed in the universe before, assembling unique atomic geometries into molecules that have never existed. Very poetic, very interesting. <laughs> Next thing you know, I come to the startling conclusion, I'm a chemist. How did that happen? Well, one thing leads to another, and I find myself at Princeton University in the medicinal chemistry program working with Professor E.C. Taylor. And I'm working on anti-cancer drug, and a wonderful group of people, and I actually came up with this, this molecule, a lot of people on this team, called Alimta. 
which is considered, you know, today the most successful anti-cancer drug in the history of pharmaceutical sciences. I published like 17 papers. My mom passed away in 2002 of lung cancer, receiving a derivative of the drug that I had designed 10 years earlier with, in graduate school. Talk about this weird relationship between science and society. It didn't extend her life, it just improved the quality so that she could, you know, she was actually driving herself to chemotherapy up until, you know, a few weeks before she passed away. Well, so Princeton's very proud of me. They take pictures of me in front of American flags and stories about this kid who's doing all these things. One day in my lab, the phone rings and it's a corporate officer of the Polaroid Corporation. He calls me up, he says, John, I've been following your career. Remember when you were on Celebrity Magazine? I remember what you were doing. I'm thinking stalker at this point. Uh, <laughs> he goes, let's have lunch. <laughs> so I, I, I told six people where I would be and what time I'd get back. And at lunch, he, asked, he, he says, I'm going to give you a job. I want you to head exploratory research at Polaroid with me. I'm going to, you know, get a team of people, and I'm going to give you three job uh, requirements. Make Polaroid a better company, do good science, and have fun. Well, that sounded interesting, but I'm a medicinal chemist. I was planning on going into academia. I was going to work on, on cures for diseases and things like that. Then he told me how much he was going to pay me. <laughs> and I said, when do I start? Um, <laughs> And so, next thing you know, I find myself surrounded by these beautiful people at Polaroid, and we are working on holography, we're working on instant photography, we're working on imaging systems, we're doing all kinds of different things. And while I'm working on different things, came up with this, this weird thing that I call non-covalent derivatization. Okay, and I'm not gonna kill you on this one, but um, I am such a nerd, the license plate of my car is NCD for non-covalent derivatization. <laughs> Much to the horror of my children, un you know, unless they wanna borrow the car, then I say it's no can do. But, um, <laughs> but what non-covalent derivatization is, is it's molecular level biomimicry, if you will, you know, in, 150 years of industry and chemistry, we have learned to make the most complex and complicated molecules imaginable. But we use high temperature, high pressure, and nasty reagents. Whereas nature constantly outperforms us, hands down, and yet uses room temperature, ambient pressure, and water as a solvent. And so non-covalent derivation is the scientific interpretation of what's going on. And, and the idea is that we, for 150 years in chemistry, have been ego-driven to make molecules do what we want them to do. And yet in nature, if you think about it, molecules do what they want to do because they evolved to do what they want to do. And if we can learn that, and we can understand how molecules interact, and I, I tongue-in-cheek say, play the role of a molecular psychologist. Instead of making the molecule do what we want, put it on the couch and say, what would you like? <laughs> and then design the product to be what it wants to be. Don't have the toxicity, don't have the hazards. It just seems to make sense. Well, one thing led to another, and all of a sudden, at Polaroid, we have this invention, and they call them Warner complexes. And it's these things that, that make the photography system work better. Um, we had to go to a large-scale manufacturing of this. And in the, in the United States, if you have an invention and it works, and you're going to go to large-scale you know, manufacturing, you have to go to the EPA to get approval. There's a document called a low-volume exemption and another called a pre-manufacturing notification. So you sign all these documents and fill this stuff out, and you send it to Washington. And we did, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And a couple months later, they rejected the application. Not because of toxicity, not because of environmental impact. They said, Non-covalent derivation, what the heck is this? So I ended up flying down to Washington to give a seminar to the EPA about this technology. I'm holding my briefcase with overhead transparencies as before, you know, this electronic stuff, and I'm a little bit nervous, a little bit mad. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind, and I walk up the stairs of the EPA, and I meet the branch chief of the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, this guy named Paul Anastas. Huh. Remember the kid that I followed into the lab when I was a music major? It was him. 
I've known this guy since I was 11 years old. He, in the EPA, was already doing this thing, you know, with looking at chemicals in the environment and what and eventually became green chemistry. And we hit it off, of course, and we saying, you know, isn't it ironic? that Polaroid used to be making this process with a several step synthesis, all these reagents, all these, these components, and here I have a non-toxic, environmentally benign alternative, and I'm struggling to get it through the system. Well, does that happen? Do people in industry think about making safe materials? Is there a process by which looking at, okay, well, this is a hazardous way, this is a safe way, and you know what? They don't. Not really. You know, in the science community, we love our conferences, right? <laughs> Man, do we love our, every day there's at least 100 conferences somewhere in the world. I promise you, next Tuesday, somewhere in the world, there's a, there's a conference on diseases of the third toe of the left foot. You know, we just have those things. <laughs> but at this point, no one ever got together to say, how do you make things safe? Because there was no science. There was no framework for it. If you want a science, you have to have that framework. And so what we did, is we had this thing called green chemistry. We said, let's bring the scientific community together. Let's call this something and call it the way that scientists anticipate environmental harm at the end, but do it at the front end and teach, you know, and, and, and have these conferences go on all over the world to start sharing notes and learning about it. But the only way that can happen is if you create a science so that people can do it. Well, it's shocking, you know, so, so Paul and I, we, we wrote this book called Green Chemistry Theory and Practice. And I gotta tell you, I feel like I got turned into Forrest Gump immediately after publishing this book. It's just staggering that these two kids from Quincy, this book's been translated into over a dozen languages. We came up with what's called the 12 principles of green chemistry and you know, all over the world, they, they're talking about changing chemical industry to look at these 12 principles. Very, very strange world, but it's, it's, it's happening. And it's, it's, it's happening slowly, but it is happening. <laughs> but why is it happening slow? Well, I gotta go back to my life story for a second. Um, I'm at Polaroid, I'm an industrial chemist, I'm intellectually looking at this concept of making molecules safe and keeping it you know, appropriate as far as economics and things like that. So I'm approaching this from a very intellectual perspective. When all of a sudden, the worst thing imaginable happens. My two-year-old son dies of a birth defect. He was born with a disease called biliary atresia in which his liver was completely detached from his intestines. So he couldn't survive me metabolizing you know, certain nutrients. He got a surgery to keep him alive for a, a couple years. And by the time organ transplants, things like that happened, it was too late and we lost him. I talk like this about, oh, aren't I so cool? I'm on Celebrity Magazine. Oh, look at all my patents. Look at all my papers. Aren't I cool? At this point in my life, I suspect I was one of the most prolific synthetic organic chemists on the planet. Probably synthesized over 2,000 molecules that had never existed before. Won as many awards as you can imagine. Published as many papers as you can imagine. At the top of the game, imagine the night of my son's funeral, staring at the ceiling, asking myself, what is something I touched? caused my son's disease? What if something that I got an award for caused his birth defect? And that's when the second epiphany happened. And this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna, gonna try to get you to understand. I went to four years of undergraduate, three and a half years of graduate school. I never had a course in toxicology. I never had a course in environmental mechanisms. How is it possible that I can be such a successful chemist and never having had any course to teach me what makes a molecule toxic, what makes a molecule hazardous? So come to think of it, imagine you want to be a chemist. Think of any university you can imagine. Go online and find the courses that you have to take to get a job to work in industry to be an industrial chemist. You will find not one university will have you take a course in toxicology. Not one university will have you take a course in, on, in mechanisms of harm. Why do we have dyes that cause cancer? Why do we have dyes that, that, that plasticizes that cause birth defects? Yes, there's corporate greed, there's things like that, 
But at the end of the day, the fundamental thing is we're not training scientists not to. And that should outrage you. My father was an electrician. He couldn't come into your house and change a light bulb unless he had a document that said he could do it safely. Teachers, architects, lawyers, you can think of all the professions that require some kind of accreditation, some kind of documentation that they can do things safe and are aware of the state of the art. How is it possible that the only humans on the planet, given the gift of making a new molecule that has never existed before, they can assemble atoms in, in, in unique geometries and have absolutely no responsibility to anticipate if they're about to make the most potent neurotoxin in history, the most potent cancer, carcinogen in history. Till we address that, we got some serious issues. Okay, and that is what we really need to focus a little bit on, is how do we figure out the alternatives? You know, God knows, you know, Environmental regulations, laws, are the hallmark of keeping us safe. And we have to be ever vigilant and get even more strong about banning bad molecules, getting rid of hazardous materials, and really watchdogging what's going on in the world. However, we've got to realize that unless the alternatives exist, those bans are just going to languish in court. And really, we need to look at this as a two-pronged thing. There is the demand for safe chemicals, which the laws and the policies and, the, and that is critical. But if the supply isn't there, if we have a regulation that goes to industry that says, you've got to stop using this material, and they can't turn to a chemist to say, let's invent an alternative, then their only option is turn to the lawyer to fight the ban. So if we can have 10 safe alternatives for every nasty material, if we can figure out how can we change the world. In the United States, if you want funding from the federal government and you're a scientist in the United States, you better have the word nanotechnology in the title of your proposal. We've allocated $10 billion over the last decade in, in, in nanotech. Name one college of university that doesn't have a nano center or a nano this or a nano that. There's no funding in the United States for green chemistry. All right? There is no named programs, you know, there's, there's nothing, okay? There is hope, there is hope. China has 14 national research labs dedicated to green chemistry technologies. It's India, India is piloting a mandated program in, in, in Delhi to require all chemistry students to take a one-year course in green chemistry. So other companies, and you know why they're getting it? Because it's about competitive advantage. The world has changed that 10 years ago, people would laugh and talk about, oh, sustainability, but you know, that's not true anymore. It is a, I would, in fact, I would argue that the single biggest impediment in success in the marketplace isn't science, isn't business, it's understanding the landscape of the environmental regulations today and tomorrow and consumer needs that are driven by the, a, a more savvy population that's now demanding safe materials. So if you have a material that has superior performance, superior cost, and is safe, you've got a profitable business. And other countries are figuring that out. We're going to. I'm absolutely hopeful that we will figure this out, and it, it'll happen, it just takes a long time, I guess. But, but the idea is to, is to start looking at how we train our scientists, how we do it. But Einstein said, and Kenny quoted this also yesterday, no problem can be solved by the same level of awareness that created it. If this isn't a call for diversity, we need new eyes, we need new ideas, we need new passion at the design table of chemistry to see things in a different way and approach it in a different way. So we need more people to come into the sciences. But like I said at the very beginning, with all the nasty that we hear on the news about all the bad, who in their right mind would go into chemistry today? And if they did, do you think it's because they think that's a way of saving the world? Well, if we have no one inventing the alternatives and we're stuck with just the things that we have today, we're in trouble. So we need that new mindset. We need these people to be coming into the thing. And so we've got a question again, that experience that I had about art and science, 
that we, we, we have this, this relationship. If I go to a party and we're hanging out and someone says, what do you do? And I say, I'm a chemist. Talk about a conversation stopper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hated chemistry. <laughs> you know? think, think of what we abdicate by that, with that reaction. Think of what we say we have nothing to do with because we didn't like chemistry. I would argue chemistry is no different, no more difficult than any other subject in school. It is the most poorly taught. This is, a, this is an issue of education. Okay. So, if I, if, if I were to take a piano and play a diminished seventh chord, and then I would resolve it to a major seventh chord, many people go, oh, that sounds nice. Now, the major seventh chord by itself is a nice harmonic sound, but without that tension created by the diminished seventh chord, you don't really get that good feeling when you resolve it. Musicians know that. Musicians do that. When chemists invent ways of making molecules, you know what they do? They have to start at one level of energy and create tension in the molecule so that when it releases, it makes the molecule that they want. Who would have ever thought that a musician and a chemist could sit down and compare notes? Why is it in our academic system, it's all about compartmentalization. You know, it's not enough to be an artist or a scientist, not enough to be a chemist or a physicist, not enough to be an organic chemist, not enough to be a synthetic organic chemist, not enough to be a heterocyclic synthetic. You know, we compartmentalize, compartmentalize, <laughs> compartmentalize. You know what? That does nothing for society. It's great for publishing papers. But that's not solving problems. You know, publishing papers is not the same as solving problems. I met my, my, my father-in-law is a soccer coach. One day we were talking about synthesis. And I was saying, OK, well, what we do, we have a molecule that has a couple atoms on it. And what I want to do is I want to react a group over here. But this, this atom is in the way, and this atom's in the way. So I have to put a molecule, and I'm describing it. And he goes, huh. And he, put, he draws out a soccer play, where well, here's the goaltender, here's the offensive player, here's, and, and you know, it's amazing how it superimposes, but who would have ever thought that you could put a chemist with an uh, athletic director, soccer coach, and compare notes? We're all in this together. This, we need to think about things in a different way. If we keep doing it the way we are, we're gonna keep having the same molecules. And so we've gotta recognize that everyone has a role to play in this. You don't have to become chemists. But we gotta, we, you have a right, in fact, you have a responsibility to step up to the plate and understand a little bit more about what's going on. Okay, because right now, if someone comes and says something is dangerous, and someone else says something is safe, do you feel capable of knowing who's telling the truth and who's lying? And don't you deserve to know that? And that's what we really need here, okay? It, so. I'm convinced, I'm convinced we're going to succeed. It's going to take a little bit of time, but it's going, to, it's going to happen because society is demanding safe materials. Next generation of students want to learn how. They don't have all the tools yet. And I think the Bioneer community is just the one to step up, help the next generation of scientists appreciate the universe for what it is and understand their impact. And all together, let's save the world. Thank you.